All right. And I just meant to confirm, Jamie, that um, you did get the film on the box and all of that and all good. Yes, I did. But you, you're, you're still going to show it, correct? Oh, OK. See, I'm glad we had this little side chat. <laughs> I thought that you were going to put it on there. Oh, no, 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 no. Because I was like, I think, um, OK, I'm glad we dis discussed this, too, because I was like, oh, um, <laughs> um, I thought um, I mentioned like, no, you can you can please show it still. OK, let me just start closing some windows. Then. <laughs> OK, perfect. That works. Yeah. That works. Yeah. So everyone, I'm about to um, make the broadcast. I mean, allow participants to come in. This, OK, cool. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. This is great. Great. So we're gonna get started in a few minutes or a few moments, but just we're gonna wait till a little bit more people come in before we get started. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming in. And feel free to, um, in the comment or in the chat box, to just like state your name, where you're from, and your pronouns, and what is bringing you today to um, the event on Pat Robinson and honoring her life and legacy. OK, I'll go first. Um... My name is Erica Hardison, and I'm a journalist and a writer. I am here, all my pronouns are her and she. Um, I'm here because my curiosity got the best of me, and a big part of being a writer and a journalist is, you know, always uncovering things and finding new things to talk about. So I was online, and I was... Um, actually, the topic was, you know, where did the sentiment of, um, you know, feminism isn't for Black women came from? Like, where did that notion start? So I kind of went down a rabbit hole um, of, you know, starting with the 50s, you know, how, you know, white feminism pretty much sidebar black women because they didn't see black women as actual women and they blame the ills of black people's issues and trauma on black women wanting to work and I then found out that those sentiments of this woman's book was you know regurgitated in um, Ebony magazine in the 60s which was also used and um, a senator's report as he detailed, you know, crime rates and stuff like that. He, he kind of used that information that had been circulating for a while. And one of the things that was highlighted in those sentiment was like, you know, black women are, you know, they're willingly taking birth control pills. They are, they want to work. They don't want to stay home. They're just, they're destroying the traditional family. And it really had me in awe because here we are in 2020 having the same conversations. And I just so happened to come across this letter uh, that was sent to Black women um, from a group of militant Black men from, uh, I believe, somewhere upstate New York. And they were pretty much just begging Black women to not take birth control and uh, to, you know, don't be, you know, a, a vehicle for white supremacy. And the response was basically, it was so raw and it was so true that, you know, um, Black women, you know, we take birth control because it's our choice and we shouldn't be uh the only sole responsible person um to you know carry children be the you'd be the breadwinner so and signing the signature was a person called pat robinson 
So I just started looking for her information, looking for her information, and I posted the screenshots on Fabulous Mag on Facebook, and like a lot of people started sharing it. Um, it was shared in like a lot of feminist groups and stuff like that. So that's how I met Dr. Spencer, who was basic, who basically told me that you know she was writing about her life, and like she was basically telling me everything that you know what we know now today is through Dr. Spencer. Thank you so much for sharing that, Erica. Yes, and for those in the chat box, please feel free to, you know, just like I said, drop your name, your where you're located, uh, your pronouns and what brings you here. And you'll definitely hear more from Erica. Um, you'll definitely hear from more from Dr. Spencer and Lupe family. Um, so we're just gonna get started. My name is Shami Swift. I am the executive director of Black More Radicals. It's really nice um, for everyone to be here to learn about the life, legacy, and leadership of like what Erica was saying of, of Pat Robinson, um, who is a powerhouse radical black feminist and while may have been a lesser known black feminist is still vitally important to um, black political thought and behavior. And we need to make sure we honor her legacy and all that she has done in terms of paving the way for us to be here. And so before we get started, um, I really want to emphasize one thing. I always say this before our events is that this is a safe space, right? So we do not accept any transphobia, homophobia, ableism, um, racism, sexism, massage noir that's not accepted in this space. And so if you cannot honor that, I will unfortunately have to kick you out. Um, but this is a safe space and um, I'm looking forward to a generative conversation. So before we really get started and let Erica, Dr. Spencer, and Lupe, you know, have the floor. I would really like to introduce our panelists uh, properly, um, and I would like to read their bios. So I will read about these amazing powerhouse women um, shortly. So first off, we have Erica Hardison, who you heard explain about how she um, came to know about the amazing Pat Robinson. But Erica Hardison is an aspiring novelist, journalist, and founder of Fabulize Magazine which is a print and digital publication covering entertainment and cultural for black feminist nerds. And I will drop Erica Hardinson's social media handle so you can follow her and support her work um, at Fabulize Mag. So thank you, Erica, for being here and hosting this event. Next up, we have Lupe Family. Lupe Family is a novelist, playwright, and poet who writes about issues of society, including socialism, labor, women and undoing racism with raw clarity, creativity and layered insight. She has MA in education and a BFA a work, and is a BFFA workshop consultant and a certified Hatha yogi instructor and Reiki energy healer. She's an undoing racism practitioner who has facilitated many workshops and talkbacks. She co-founded phone meetings for support during this pandemic and has led workshops on using meditation and yoga to undo racism through reflection at the annual Lehman College Restorative slash Transformative Justice Conference through City University of New York. She is the author of To Face It, a novel about radical women of color in New York that is available for purchase online through indie books and other outlets. Her YouTube channel, Lupe To Face It, contains shorts from the video series of Pat Robinson that she is working on. Uh, Pat Rob Murphy Robinson, the woman slash a black revolutionary molecule. And I'll also drop the links to support Lupe family as well and support her work. So thank you Lupe for being here. And last but not least, we have Dr. Robin Spencer, who is an associate professor of history at Lehman College where she teaches courses on, black, on the black freedom movement. Her areas of research include civil rights and black power, urban and working class radicalism and gender. Her writings on the Black Panther Party have appeared in the journal Women's History, Souls, radical teacher in many collections of essays on the 1960s. She is the author of The Revolution Has Come, Black Power, Gender, and the Black Panther Party, published by Duke University Press. Her latest work focuses on the intersections between the movement for Black liberation and the movement against the U.S. war, on, war in Vietnam. In addition, she is working on biographies of both Angela Davis and Patricia Murphy Robinson. So make sure also too to follow Pat Archives, which I'll drop in the chat on Instagram, which spotlights the ways that items in Black left theorist Patricia Murphy Robinson's unprocessed home archives reframe the Black radical tradition. So without further ado, 
And this event is in the hands of the amazing guests. And yeah, we're ready to learn about Pat Robinson. All right. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> um, before we go into the um, the film, I want to ask a question, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Spencer, how did you feel when you saw that those screenshots of Pat Robinson's uh, response was on Facebook? What was your initial reaction? Can't hear you. You're on mute. I was excited. I was excited to see that a primary source that I might use in a classroom had made it out of the confines of the archive and was being utilized <laughs> to create a conversation amongst young people on social media. So when I saw that document, it was almost like seeing something that you work on out of place. So I immediately responded to the conversation to say, yes, there was this amazing woman whose history is represented just a little bit in that snippet that we saw on Facebook, which was the document that she created, which included her and others talking about Black women and birth control. But there was so much more. That was just the tip of the iceberg. I just wanted people to know that if you thought that one document was amazing, wait until you read more things that she wrote learned more about her life and her analysis. So um, I'm excited. I'm also excited that there are people in the audience and on the panel like Lupe family who knew Pat Robinson. Um, I see some folks in the chat um, saying that as well. So it's exciting that we're all here together. So maybe I can start us off by answering the question of, well, who was Pat Robinson? So I wanna give just a short, um, description and then um, I think Lupe will follow up with another type of remembrance of Pat Robinson from, from people who did, didn't know her. So Pat Robinson was born in 1926 in the thick of transnational Pan-African organizing. Um, she was raised in the Black elite as part of the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper family. So she came from a family of people who were working hard to put out the news about uh, Black life and to criticize the realities of Jim Crow at the time. She became radicalized though. She became radicalized by Marxist theory and experiences of sexism and racial inequality. And those theories would become her compass until she passed away in 2013. So when we're examining her life, we're looking at someone who was born in 1926 and passed away in 2013. So it's important to note that Pat Robinson is not someone who was, you know, from the 60s and passed away in that time period. She was just here, right? In some ways, her spirit is still here. And so tonight we're trying to raise her spirit to speak to her legacy and her politics and to ask how it continues to be relevant um, to politics today. So she was known for being a strong advocate for women, a feminist, for having a strong class analysis, for being a critic of capitalism. She was a psychotherapist. She had a very holistic view of political struggle, including mental health. <laughs> That's it, Rob. That's Robin, what is that say. finished? That's what okay. I so, so I, I want to say that Pat's here. She's fooling around. Uh, if you just saw that I lost my video, did people see that? Oh, you all kept seeing me even though I lost the connection, Robin? Yes. You could still see me even though you didn't. You're I, I couldn't see you. Oh, yep. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say, yeah, I'll just say, yeah, Pat is saying, Remember capitalism and all the spectrum and, you know, whoever else is your internet service provider. So I suggest everybody get the phone for the backup just in case. Okay. That's, that's one thing that I know Pat would be saying right now. And um, I'm just going to close my eyes for a minute because I would love for people to go inside. And since you can stretch wherever you are and you can move around, please do that because we're two hours working with y'all. <laughs> and um Maybe we can just, 
<sighs> and if my fellow panelists will take a risk with me and just look to the left, I'd like to see the future. Uh, Erica, you talk so well about how Pat inspired you from where you were. And she always talks about time and history. And so the back of your brain, just let the remnants of what her life meant and let it come forward through us into the future because there'll be people after. Thank you, thank you. So now I'm gonna read a little bit. I just honor all the people in the chat in the, in the wider world that are vibing with this who couldn't make it because they have to work for a slave for the capitalist today. And I'm gonna say what a man named Bill, white bodied male um, said in um, 2013 when she died uh, because he could not come across the uh, river called the Ocean of uh, Atlantic, which had many, uh, he, he, he wanted to tell us, uh, you know, what he felt about Pat. And um, he, he's gonna mention some colleagues. I just wanna um, prompt uh, Dr. Robbins' mind on this because we did something in, in Brooklyn once and uh, one of these people was there. And he um, is talking about revolution because Pat was a revolutionary as far as I'm concerned. So what he said, and this is on uh, pmrbio.wordpress.com, so you can find it yourself, is that Pat helped to reorient many activists to be clear in their struggles for free, loving communities without the oppression of family or the state or corporations, Getty, JP Morgan Banks. And he said that this was all how she was reorienting under imperialism and capitalism. And please put in the chat, you know, if you're not getting what that is, please help us to help this discussion to be, you know, vibrant and real. That's how Pat always was. He also says she helped women of color and supporters to challenge the status quo in the black liberation and the women's movements from the time she began practicing revolution. During the last century. And in the, cause he wrote it and we took it from what he said. She was one of the rad complexion of black and Latina Latino political culture and black radicalism by expanding boundaries. And her colleagues and fellow writers, she was the editor of Lessons from the Damned, Class Struggle in the Black Community. And I do have the book right here. Uh, we'll miss her. And it was published in the seventies and then the second edition came out in the nineties and um, it is online in PDF from libraries. It was produced by times changes like that. So they went out of business. And two anthologies, one is Words of Fire uh, by Guy Sheftal. And, uh, uh, as the editor, and want to start a revolution. She is Jean Theo Harris, Brooklyn College, Kamozi or Komozi Woodard, please feel free to correct my pronunciation. We'll all miss her spirit, her clarity, and her fire. <laughs> I just want to show a picture of the cover of that because people might see it somewhere online, especially in Dr. Robin's beautiful archives Instagram. And she had many fellow radical writers, and some of them are in here, and some of them are in here. And that's it, thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> We're probably waiting for the, um, the film now, the, the video, right? Okay. So I wanna invite people while we're waiting yes. just to, to breathe. Okay. 
Take those breaths in and see if you can vibe with Pat. I'm gonna show a photo while we wait. This is Pat, she's in front of her home. Robin, help me if you if you can't see. Can you see? I'm focusing on working on uh, putting up the video. Oh, you're I'm doing it. I thought. That. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought you. I do have a quick okay, question. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Can you hear me? What do you think um, Pat Robinson would say about the elections and politics today? Like, do you think she would um, advocate for Black women to let their voice be heard and vote? Or would you think she would, you know, put emphasis more on organizing? Oh, one thing about the film, there's gonna be a part where it's typewriting. And so people from a generation that don't know what that is, that means you get to close your eyes and look and see the words without a visual. And that's Great. when we're talking about that. Great. Thank you for asking that question, Erica. I mean, who cannot be thinking and talking about elections today, given where we are as a country right now? I really appreciate that you brought that in. Um, maybe we can bookmark that. And once you meet her, for those who don't know her, who are out there with us um, on Zoom, you'll be able to get a sense of, of who she was and you might speculate about how she feels about um, electoral politics and all types of politics. You really get a chance to see her as a deeply political person. So I I'm, I'm, was told that my screen share is successful. How so do you make a chocolate cake? Start. Is it the same way you make a woman? Is it the same way you make a phenomenal woman? Mother, teacher, student, activist? Is it the same way you make a revolutionary? A little of this, a little of that. Is it each ingredient coming together in its own divine timing and divine journey to combine into the best batter possible, but only the universe and her will to create a little pressure, a lot of heat. Don't forget the most important ingredient, love. Mm -hmm. In the case of Patricia Murphy Robinson, perhaps. So, what's so special about 1994? 1994. What a year. This was a year of major trials and turmoil, and one where the public demanded a massive changing of the guard. What? 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 Watch this. The whole world burned. This new wave waves, hellish hope, and some dope highlights. Something else was brewing. Something a lot more low key, but just as powerful. In 1994, some good vibes, family, and some revolutionary conversations brought three women around a familiar kitchen table. Years later, two of those women, Pat's daughter, Robin Robinson Kirkpatrick, and mentee, student, and friend, Lupe family, come full circle. Must be the spirit of Pat in the air, because on cue is the chocolate cake.
2018. Many revolutionary legends have come and gone. Some stories known, but most unknown. All right, so this is the seat that Pat Robinson sat in. Um, and of course, we used to go get together and stuff. Hi, Sari. Your part now, yes, yes. You ready, Lupe? Here we go. Personal letters to Pat, written by Lupe family. Hi, Pat. I miss you. Do we want to own ourselves? Miss the hell out of your clarity. Mm -hmm. Education is now stupidity, mm -hmm. which is why nobody wants to go to school because it's totally antithetical to real life. Mm. You put a map in front of my young eyes that was real and big. If you are in equilibrium mm. with your environment and yourself, mm -hmm. you really have to understand the society. And you really have to think it through and look at it fully. I was provoked into thinking by your wow for me. Question. Do I play the game or do I not? You live in this reality and always kept alive and real. At the end of 59, that's when my mouth started open. I did not care about shit. I'm going to say what I mean. You shared my life of letting go of the illusions. You don't have an answer to it, you better they compensate. You can outstand you can out, them. Outmaneuver right? one of the most important mm. lessons. And this is what I've done with all of you all was to, to teach you very slowly how to destroy the mm. psychological. Mm. You showed me how to keep my own life strong and study as much as I could. Ooh. And that's how I got stronger and stronger. To provoke her to think so that it began to simmer inside of her. could not have created any change in her without the process of her turning it over in her mind. I learned from you tremendous reflection of telling the truth and exposing the hypocrisy. I learned that I did not come out of just nothing. I, like all of us, come out of our conditions. We make choices. Uh, but I knew what the weakness was. And the minute you get the weakness, you stay off. And right. you don't get off. Right. And the weakness. Right. I love that you would sit with me and let me have my own feelings. I could be myself around you. You were able to make connections with me. Look at example. Make a plan. They have gone into another state of consciousness, which is totally distortion of reality. Mm. Family, spiritual power, economic faith, the money class, the essence, the appearance, the opportunity, right. technology, my problem and my responsibility. Mm. The future, it can be done. Great history, the human being, mm. work, the strength that is there. That's the kind of spiritual power that is no way you can do. There's no way any motherfucker is going to take me off. Mm -hmm. I decide, and I'm not important. I'm just one little small model. 
revolutionary molecule. From the obituary written by Lupe family. She was one of the radical women in the political arena who changed the complexion of Black and Latina political culture and Black radicalism by expanding boundaries. Expanding boundaries, revolution as a practice. This was her forte. It wasn't enough to just be an activist or only be a teacher. Pat was a strategist. Her independent mind, intellect, discipline, study, and soul made her critical thinking sharp and unique. She was excellent in using and communicating history as a tool, a tool to willfully make sure this history wouldn't be repeated by next generations. That's the end of our snippet of the film. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we can be large and in charge again. And we'll transition to our thoughts and ideas after. So I know that Erica wants to start us off with a question for you, Kay the filmmaker. Erica? I, I don't hear you, Erica. Uh, Robin, is Erica now? muted? Can you hear oh. me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, um, that, that's a song. <laughs> it seems like Pat was very much a great shooter. Like, you know, all she wanted to do was like just tell the truth, and she really didn't um, care for you know, you know, who liked it or not. So, you know, what was it like to be like? 
in her circle, like to be her friend? Was it a difficult relationship? Was it more of a, you know, uh, you have to kind of like hold your own around her because she has a very powerful uh, personality. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> this is a business card. I just want to show people that because look at that beautiful lovingness in that photo, okay? Oh, that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the lovingness of uh, Pat was so evident in the reason why she spoke truthfully and straight from the hip, uh, not hiding. Um, and I'll circle back to that in a minute. I just want to say that, uh, you know, all of us out here slaving away under wage slavery, which is what Pat would say, you know, we have to wear that mask and, you know, kiss that, you know what. And she kept getting fired, you know, from these jobs. And um, what she, I think, imparted to me is that you got to save that money. You have to be clear that you're under a vicious capitalist system. So being around her was very nourishing because as well as being so straight with her uh, articulation verbally, she would also give you tips that you need to read, you know, the financial armadillo, for example, and just be clear that you're under a capitalist system that's going to work your nerves for the rest of the time that we're here if we don't transform to a revolutionary, you know, socialist society. So that's why it wasn't so hard to be around her for me, because I was willing to hear the, uh, the straight talk. And I was gratified to know that somebody could see this system. She always used to say, you don't know where you are. You don't know where you live. You don't have an opinion. You've been, you know, socialized and um, made into a plastic, uh, way of speaking because this is what capitalism does. And, you know, maybe in a minute I'll read something from Lessons from the Damned about that. But that's how it was for me to be around her. And all the other, you know, strong people that did many events together, International Working Women's Day. Um, and I think I learned from that that that's kind of how I am also now. I'm not so hiding behind, you know, flowery language. Uh, but if I'm at a class uh, situation where the oppressor is directly, you know, about to arrest me, like with the MTA in New York subways, I will, you know, become, like she used to say, I'm the other Pat. She had a, a vibration on one shoulder that was telling her to say something like that. And then she had a vibration on another shoulder that was telling her to, that this person needed it a little bit more gently. Who was she inspired by? Like, who did she look up to? Who did she look for inspiration? You know, what were, who were some authors and uh, activists that she really adored? Robin, you want to start with that and I'll come in? Sure, sure. Well, in the video, we saw some of the people that were part of her circle intellectually or maybe even personally. In her archive, there are many letters between her and um, Yuri Kochiyama. I don't know if you saw her. She was the woman who was walking to her desk. And the images of her desk, you can find it on, on the internet because she was known for being such a tireless advocate and um, activist. And I had the chance of meeting her myself here in New York. But Yuri Kochiyama, I think, was someone who um, worked alongside Pat, who inspired her. Of course, as many people from the 60s generation, Malcolm X was a big influence. She was also very international. She took her inspiration from activists and revolutionaries from around the world, Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana, Mirkal Cabral, um, Mao Zedong, uh, Angela Davis, the people who were her peers, Angela Davis, the women in, um, Gwen Patton, uh, who was part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I can go on and on from the names that you know and there are household names to the names that you don't know. Like her, unfortunately, she's one of the names that should be a household name, but we don't know her name. But her circle included many ordinary people 
who were bravely trying to come together and educate themselves out of the bag of and the boxes that society had put them in. So her circle, I think, included many people that she was inspired by. But in terms of like, if you look at like her books, and I can give you like quantitative research and evidence, she had a lot of books by Mao Zedong. She had a lot of um, sort of early feminist authors, a um, lot of, of connection with what was happening in Brazil. Uh, Latin and Central America, all of those struggles and movements she was inspired by. She had artwork from some of the major um, people creating art at the time. And um, her music taste varied widely from soul to jazz to the lover of classical music. So she was inspired broadly. She was inspired broadly. Um, Robin and Erica, I'm going to jump in for a minute with that. Where is Robin Robinson? I hope she's in this chat. That's her daughter. And one thing that is on the raw footage, I'm looking for, we're looking for, the archives is looking for a beautiful person in internal soul that's willing to call through that raw footage and create more of a video series. So Robin Robinson was born in the 50s. And um, in the raw footage, when I went and taped Pat, and Robin was often on the um, tripod, you know, running the camera, um, was the inspiration during the time period. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Robin will give some historical uh, perspective. The 50s is when we're in what we're in now. We're in a fascist-like time period. Uh, people are being arrested. Uh, you know that in Seattle, I mean, sorry, Portland, people were arrested and just taken off the streets. Where did they go? So here's Robin, just born. She's like a little, you know, a little baby. And Pat is, she said, I lost a lot of weight. That's what she said. I lost a lot of weight. And you see from that little photo and, and from her in the video, she's not a big woman. So she lost a lot of weight. And she says, and I got depressed. And I looked at that uh, little baby in that playpen and then, um, she changed from just looking at her. And she said, and I started carrying her around on my back all the time, reading my books that Dr. Robin just talked about. Fidel is another uh, person and that whole revolutionary movement of Cuba uh, and the women of Cuba. Uh, she went to Cuba. But I would say that uh, I want Robin, if you're on here, Robin, I want you to hear this, that that is what we as uh, revolutionary mothers and aunties and, you know, granddads or whoever we are can also take inspiration from. And I know you're a mom, Erica, you know, because those are the people that will be after us. That's the future. And we want to uh, create for the present to be a transformation and also for the future. That's why I would say, even though she didn't say this a lot, because um, I didn't really know a lot about Native American uh, indigenous uh, revolutionary politics at the time, but I know that she carried that in her spirit that we are seven generations responsible for the future. And you know, Erica, you might want to say something about being uh, inspired by your child, you know, because that's one thing that Pat often said that those who reproduce the labor force, and she worked a lot with um, red stockings, red stockings. Uh, with uh, Kathy, Sarah Child, uh, about looking at what women's labor in the capitalist world is so discounted because it's unpaid. I'm actually thinking that, you know, um, because she was born in 1926, my grandmother was born in 1922. And there's a lot of similarities with women, black women that were born in that time, like they have like a certain resilience to them. However, my grandmother never openly embraced calling herself a feminist, even though she had the traits of a feminist. Um, because Pat came from a prominent family, what do you think was her turning point on being anti-capitalist? I'm still, I can speculate, and those who know her, I mean, I'm just at the beginning of, of my research project, but 
you know, one, I think we have to look to her family. Um, who, so she was born into a family of people who were already race conscious, who were running this black newspaper that was putting out the word on racism and Jim Crow. On the other hand, she did have radical members of her family, people who were communists. I believe her uncle um, would come to Harlem and was part of some of the radical activities in Harlem um, in the 1940s. I would guess that might have had an influence on her. At the same time, what was also influencing her was the repression of the time. In the video, she talks about the Cuban Revolution. Remember, she tells us that after 1959, you know, she didn't care about shit. That's what she said. <laughs> Quote. So that was her moment of like speaking out um, at the end of the 50s. But like many people, I think it's a relatable story. You become politicized, but perhaps it's that you're busy child rearing or you're dealing with your economic situation or your partner and all of that. And so she turned inward to educate herself. And I think her life story, one of the reasons it inspires me is that it is the story of, of a pursuit of knowledge and not knowledge for a credential or degree or to lord over someone else but it was a knowledge that she gathered and shared and transferred and um, understood that the people that she was um, speaking to as one of our attendees in the audience reminds us that she, Pat would say that she learned as much from the ordinary people as um, she may have learned from her book. So it was really a transfer of information um, that she was part of. So she was an amazing teacher and a mentor, I think. That is what I'm gathering just from my research. I'm at the beginning of the process in terms of speaking to a lot of people who knew her in person. Except Lupe, of course. <laughs> uh, Erica, Erica, would you, would you restate that? I wanna say something specific about the family. Um, I said, what do you think was her turning point? of being anti-capitalist, anti-capitalism coming from a middle-class family. Because oftentimes we see a lot of middle-class Black people, you know, they want to keep, you know, moving upward. They don't want to really associate themselves with people that aren't um, of their standing. Great. Well, I want to uh, reveal some things that I think are important for us to know about the family. And I don't mean just her family. Uh, there's a paper that she has written. Um, it's in the larger, you know, video. Uh, it's also on pmrbio.wordpress.com uh, about how the family is trained to be the ideology factory for the capitalists. So even though there was, I believe, uh, the race consciousness, um, Du Bois, I think, was in the because the newspaper was called the African American and they were in Maryland, segregated Maryland. Uh, the issue was that her mother was passing. Her mother would go into the store, this is in the raw footage, and um, she would tell Pat, who's light as Pat is, to stay outside because she didn't want her to reveal by her beingness that, oh, this, this woman was uh, the mother of a black child. And then uh, Pat would, she, she said this, she said, I'd mull it over in my mind, Ooh, that woman. And then she'd say, but she's going to get me something nice, you know? So I think that that relationship, and many of us have this with the family of origin, that's going along with the system on some level, like you said, uh, Erica, about, uh, I think Pat would call it the petty bourgeoisie. She wouldn't say the middle class because she's very much a Marxist and she will use those types of terms, uh, you know? taught us that if we're gonna keep going forward, we're either gonna to have to submit like they have been submitting on some level to create that class divide in the black and brown community, or we're gonna to have to rebel. So I know that that was a big thing that she did talk with me personally about. And also uh, she says in the, in the raw footage, uh, some other things about when she and um, the family, the uh, nuclear family, not her extended family, when she went to college, you know, she started to see really what those college experiences were about. So I want to read one little thing about uh, this book, from this book, uh, Lessons from the Dam, which is edited by Pat, but it says, 
let our individual names pass away and be forgotten with all the nameless like us. Because I think the more she interacted with more working class people, um, because her husband uh, worked in a school that he was the guidance counselor and a lot of people from that school, including Maureen uh, Atterbury, also known as Catherine, uh, would come to, you know, hang out with Robin and, and Pat and um, Chris and Kim, the, the twins. And um, they would talk about, you know, what were the contradictions in the school system? So in this book, they have a piece about um, staying in the system for the children's sake, about the teachers. But they also talk about the families and they say we have to be aware of a person's class background and the class he imitates or admires. This has to affect his thinking and world outlook, which in turn determines actions. In other words, start where his head is at. Don't, don't open the nose too fast. You can't give a person what their hands don't call for. You can take a sister or brother to the entrance of the tunnel of self and political discovery, but you can't go in there with them. They have to trip alone without a guide. They have to see for themselves before political consciousness can travel from the head to the gut. Everyone needs concrete proof from practice before theory is formed and absorbed. So I'll just end by saying, so I think that as she started watching the times and she saw, you know, uh, Robin, you might want to go into this more. I don't know, but here you are. Um, there's some people that are saying, Oh, we need to have black nationalism and, you know, black capitalism. That's going to work. That's going to free our people from all this bondage of, you know, working these, you know, really horrible jobs like the essential workers today with, you know, no benefits and they'll kill you if, if they, since they need to, we need your, your labor, but who cares about whether you're laboring tomorrow? And as she started to see that and recognize and see, I think one other thing is she saw China erupt from a peasant society in 49. Cause she says that, uh, in that more footage. Uh, and then in 59, when the peasants, the workers, the laborers of Cuba, had a general strike for nine days, people. That's what we're going to need to do here in the U.S. Uh, in this time period. She saw that you could have a powerful movement of people who really cared about humanity, I think, internationally, and that helped her to move away from being uh, this, I guess Baltimore is a little bit of a small town, but the girl from Baltimore with the light skin privilege and um, colorism and all that that crap entailed. So I think that's what helped her to really widen her consciousness and become much more class and uh, race and gender, you know, clear. Eric, I think your sound is off again. Yes, but, but I have a question for you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to ask Robin if she thought it might be good to bring in some of the history because I think Pat loved history. And that's what all of us today could know. Your history. One day, there's a woman that's in this uh, audience today. Oh, gosh. I hope you can still hear me. Robin, can you still hear me? Because my video left. Going, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, capitalism is not going to kill this, this webinar. You know, because you could be having people from the CIA, et cetera, on here. So people just be aware. Um, so this young woman in her 20s, 30s, Yvonne Mayton from United Tradeswomen, she told me that uh, when we all were coming to her house one day for like a meeting with Pat, she looked out the door uh, inside the little people and she said, oh my God, I thought this big voice, big woman, this is the first time she's going to meet her, uh, was going to be very tall and Pat is like 5'1", you know. <laughs> and so she said... Pat did when we sat on that little futon in Yvonne's Bronx apartment. Where was your grandmother, you know, born and what did she do? So she grew us together uh, through different, like Gloria Zelaya from El Puente was there, I remember. She grew us from, and from Nicaragua. She grew us from different parts of the world who all lived in New York City at the time. And um, she united us through asking those worker type of questions about the mother of your mother or the mother of your father. So I thought maybe that would be a, a good thing to talk about that historical time period, Robin. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to encourage, before I do that, I want to encourage the people who are listening to uh, keep putting questions and things like that in the chat box to make sure we get as many voices and pass the mic around as, as much as possible um, in terms of that. I think certainly one of the things about the film is that it gave us our time in some way, or if you remember the 90s, we saw Shabba Ranks out in there. Heavy D, I think, was in there um, as well. Um, you got a chance to see Pat's then and also think about her early years as well. And you also saw Lupe in her early years as well. You saw like the evolution of, of people, right, in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So that is very key. So what I want to say about the 60s and 70s that Pat played such a big role in is that she really was at the forefront of challenging patriarchy of making space for black women and their voices at a time that was very hostile sometimes to black women asserting themselves and and everything she also took what could have been class privilege and she turned it into class alliance right she turned it into becoming an advocate for the working class um, empowering people in the working class to write, to think, to claim the space for themselves that oftentimes the economic system was depriving them of. So that I think is also key to kind of understanding her, um, her impossible, how she spits into the history that we might already know. And living in New York, she was in Westchester but she really traversed the distance between Westchester and Harlem. Um, and she really, her history brings us that history of New York that is not Harlem or Brooklyn, but it's, you know, Westchester, it's New Rochelle, it's White Plains, right? It's um, Peekskill. So she's giving us a new, a new vision of New York and where and how New York politics erupted and happened and how those politics were directly connected with um, what was happening in um, places that we're more comfortable thinking about as hotbeds of, of radicalism like, like Harlem. So her history, I think, connects a lot of discontinued, dis, uh, parts of our history that seem to be pulled apart. So yes, she worked with and aligned herself with radical white feminists, yes, she did. She worked with and aligned herself with the budding LGBTQI plus movement. Yes, she did. She was also a critic of and a reflection of the movement for black power as well, right? And she was a staunch transnationalist, right? She saw revolution in the biggest of terms. So one of the things that I love um, that I found in my study of her was how she would give people a new language where people would be, you know, talking about the petty bourgeoisie and, um, you know, their situation in their relationship being akin to how colonization works or how imperialism works. So she took concepts that feel far away and sometimes foreign and only at the behest of people who are educated. And she gave people that language that they seized and they, they took. And it was just such a beautiful co-creative space that she made in her relationship with um, her political um, allies and, and mentors and clients and friends and yes, even family. Uh, Erica, are you, are you in? I'm still here. Okay, because I, I want to ask you something, but I want to wait to see what else you have. Um, I have like a lot of questions because I feel like um, I'm in the space where a lot of Black women, especially like younger Black women, they are moving towards radical thought, but they don't really know where to start. You know, um, how, what type of advice do you think Pat will give to younger Black women? Can you while, say while, we think about, while we think about that, I want to just highlight that someone in the chat box said, Pat showed us our power. And I think that's very powerful to think about a leader 
showing other people their power, not just to be a leader because of the attributes they, they create, but excellent question, Erica. So we should um, think about that. And I think Lupe was asking what generation or what age were you? Yeah, can you just give us a little bit of a, of a uh, 20 to 30, 40 year olds? Because, uh, it, you know. I guess 20 to 40, because I mean, that's like two different, you know, groups or whatever, but like 20 to 40, like, you know, you have the younger women um, under 30, you know, 20s, as I know for me, 20s, my 20s were like a very transformative decade for me. You're actually coming into your own and forming into your own thoughts. And then when you get into your 30s, you pretty much feel like you know where you are, but you're still looking to like grow into the woman that you want to become. So, you know, what would Pat tell younger women, younger Black women, younger women who want to be um, activists? Um, as you all mentioned that, you know, she did work with a lot of mothers, you know, um, with the pandemic now and um, with this, you know, we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a time right now um, where it's even more unsafe for us to be by ourselves or anything can happen to us in the street. How would she advise younger women to organize? Oh, that's a great term to organize. So I want to ask you to help me to answer this. This is how Pat did. She was, I found, that's why I told you about the grandmothers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure she knew she was coming to that South Bronx apartment uh, to organize us, you know. She would inquire. So if you're a young woman in your 20s, and you can be you, Erica, in answering this, or, you know, any of your friends or, you know, your workmates or whatever you want to choose to do this, your spiritual buddies, what is the group of people that you're bringing into this uh, conversation? What is the, what, say that one more time? Yeah. Uh, Okay, in my 20s, I would be bringing in a lot of artists, okay? So in your 20s, who are the people that she's saying the answer to this question to? Who are your peeps? Oh, in my 20s, um, <laughs> definitely school, friends, um, artists. High school? High school? No, 20s, I was in college. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, art, artists, is, it, is, it, is, it a, is it a class college with you know bourgeois you know cute little things like you know we're the uh, <laughs> seven sisters or with a or the more working class you got to pay city uh, college bit, but you can get I some kind of LIU. finance. I went to LIU Brooklyn, so I, I guess that's considered like a working class. Uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, first generation immigrants, um, a lot of city kids, you know, going to, to a private school type of environment. Or oh, 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 city kids going to, to LIU, you mean, right? Right. Okay. So I don't know if you can see me because I can't see you all at all. Can you still see me? No, it's, it's just your phone icon. Okay, so I'll just say a quick answer that I'll try to get dealing with these spectrum people who have, you know, no care in the world for you paying the bill on time that they should provide any service. I'm sure she would say, talk with your peeps and ask them what's bothering them. They might talk about their family. They might talk about, you know, their love life. They might talk about that the school is ripping you off. They might talk about the teachers are not giving any kind of real information about how work relates to, to the college degree that you're supposedly um, taking up. The whole idea is to organize with others, not just be alone. And I'll you know expand on that if we have time, but that's what I think she would start with. You have some issue wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You don't have to like she would send me, I know, to monthly review press. I hope somebody could put that in the chat. Maybe Yvonne. Monthly review press. This is a press that takes up all kinds of issues from the world. And she would say, now go in there and go to what you are drawn to. You see? Like, go inside. When we didn't have the internet, 
So we would go to places. And when you're there, just look around and feel which book, which magazine, which Syracuse cultural calendar relates to you and start connecting with others who also are into what you're concerned about. Because uh, I had a conversation with the uh, woman from the United Trades woman, Yvonne, and what she was saying is that first we got to feel our own pain, our own personal connected pain. And for me, it was nationalism. For you, it might have been, you know, women's oppression. Then I went to women's oppression. And I still kept finding through the conversations with Pat, oh, this is not wide enough because I saw that the black nationalists were going to keep me. It was great. Uh, Malcolm was a nationalist, too, in the beginning. But I didn't only see racism as the problem because I saw black people in black skins saying to me in jobs, well, you know what? Forget about those Harlem kids. We're going to just do this this way. Or those women in these nonprofit, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Do we really have to bring up that issue about the black and brown women? You know, so I kept widening, but you've got to start somewhere. And usually people start where their own pain uh, resonates. Does, does that uh, vibe with you a little bit, Erica? Yeah, I understand. Um, doctors, yeah, but, but does it help that? Dr. Spencer wants to go back to um, talking about some of the points that were made in the movie. Um, in the film, we did see um, Pat at a round table in the kitchen. Yes. Was she, it, did she really like chocolate cake? Was that like her favorite? Yes, yes she did. Robin was not lying. <laughs> That was her daughter. And I love that that very real moment of like, you know, when your senses become so heightened because you might be losing other things, but then flavors and textures and your favorites become so part of your, your joy. So the chocolate cakes that she used to make from scratch for her family um, when her children were growing up became a treat for her you know, as she was entering her twilight. So um, it was really a beautiful moment to see that, see that cake. <laughs> was she a heavy smoker? <laughs> You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to say something about the smoking uh, because I brought it up to her directly. And she was so clear with me. You know what uh, her age was when she died? 86. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she was not in her 20s or her 30s with lung cancer, et cetera. She pointed out something to me who was, you know, very into alternative health and healing. And that is, oh, hi, Matt Golden, uh, that our addictions, our compulsions can faster kill us if we're not really talking about the anger, the pain, the suffering that's inside and exposing and expressing it. So I remember one day uh, I was in, a, I think it was an elevator and we were going to some person's place. I'm pretty sure it was in Manhattan. It was one of those tiny elevators. And um, I think Pat either smoked just before we got into the elevator I think we didn't have the rules that you can't smoke in the building at the time. And I might've said something like, Pat, you're smoking. She said, you got damn right. <laughs> because what she said to me next was, I'm not repressing any anger. And what she meant, and I see that this is so true. Uh, if we hold back that force that capitalism puts on our hearts and our souls, you go to these jobs, you go to these schools, you're frustrated with so many things. You don't have a job, but you don't speak about that anger and you just stuff, see with the cigarette, stuff it in. Then you don't have a place where you're releasing those um, physical things. Emotions can become physical, you know, hurts to our organs. But if, or and I'll say, if you are releasing it, you have a better chance of uh, not contracting. She didn't die of, of lung cancer. The thing is, she also said, let me see, I want to take a moment to say this well. You know, I'm dealing, she, she helped me to understand her as a human being. I'm dealing with all these different vibrational levels. You know, our consciousness as a group of people, when we would get together in these groups, was not the same. You know, there was somebody here who's like, 
very new, doesn't really understand some of the terms we're talking about stuff. Then there's like Myrna Bain. She was a, a professor at Hunter College. She would be very clear about, you know, many things, especially internationally. And um, Pat's trying to, and she did such a good job of this. She's holding all those vibrations and she's translating, not, you know, Spanish to English, but she's translating what Marxist theory means to the sister who's very gender orientated or the lesbian sister wants to talk about, you know, I want to get alternatively fertilized. And Pat was very supportive of that. So she's constantly translating. She said, I need something to just be with me so that I can be for you all. Imagine how much she gave to us all the time. That's powerful. And I want to say just from a, a textual standpoint that, you know, when you look into her home archive, you note that she has um, close to 10 dictionaries. And when she's reading in her book, she's oftentimes defining the terms. And the book Lessons from the Damned has a glossary in the back of those terms. So she was very much about um, just believing that your analysis was strong enough to overcome the temporary or the temporary restrictions of maybe not having the language or having never heard that term before or not knowing where that place is on the map or anything like that. So I think that that, um, that again, as someone who doesn't know her, I love to think about what I'm getting about her and learning and how it resonates with what people who knew her um, can recall or, or, or recollect. And I hope everyone's reading the chat box. There's a reunion in there. And it's so beautiful to see all of the people who know Pat saying, yes, she smoked when I saw her. And yes, you know, this happened, that happened. So it's great that everyone um, is here and that we're here together. When did Pat start to advocate for um, LGBTQ uh, couples, specifically Black women couples to adopt children? Well, Robin. what I found, the, ev the evidence that I found is that um, there were two bits of evidence. One is that she supported the publication of an essay advocating for lesbian mothers at a time where um, lesbian motherhood was not seen as a positive, as a probable, or as desirable on any level. It's, it feels so, in a way, somewhat commonplace here, but it's also, I think, important to um, think about her as a pioneer and also her as a door opener. Sometimes when she believes in something, it wasn't that she herself had an essay about it or something like that, but she might have opened the door and made the connections or helped someone edit their own writings about that. So those are some of the things that I found um, in the archive that sort of evidence that she was someone who was open. And that's important because this is a time where in the 1960s, the question of sexuality was a bomb in the middle of the women's movement, right? It wasn't so obvious that your feminist was gonna be on the side of you know, someone who um, considered themselves a lesbian using the prominent terminology of the time. So that was important to know as well, that she um, she had a vision of freedom that was big and that um, included speaking for groups that she didn't have any, um, you know, per se, like identity stake in. I feel like today we tend to operate so much from that place. Um, but I think she operated from a sense of justice and took made sure that she came down on the side of people who um, were fighting for, for more rights, more visibility, um, et cetera. And in this way, she and was- Erica, a I, sorry, Robin. That's all. I just wanted to say in this way, she was a pioneer. Uh, Erica, I want to turn towards your generation a little bit here before the time gets running. Uh, are you open to that? Sure. Okay. So Erica, now that you hear this, um, I'm sure that you might have some gender politics, um, especially about queer um, 
folks' issues. Look at all the trans, brown and black women that have been murdered in this last, you know, time period and all the demonstrations. You know, can you make some connection that you feel from what you know now, even just from this conversation, just take a risk if you feel comfortable, uh, because I know that that's one thing, Pat, uh, when I was interviewing her on WBAI radio, and I asked her, what should we do? She said, we cannot direct the people. We need to find out where they're at and go with them where they're leading. So that's why I'm asking you this. You want me to um, answer the question on what I feel that she would respond to? Not so much that. I mean, I hope some of this is touching you because I'm sure, you know, the beauty of these technologies is we'll see this again in 20 years. You'll be maybe almost 50 or whoever knows, you know. <laughs> so right now, I know you don't believe it. That's possible. Well, no, we'll, we'll need to do a lot more about climate. She did talk about climate justice, but let's not get off onto another hand. I just want to uh, bring it to you. You're under 40. What are you being inspired by? And I'm, I'm sort of uh, turning towards, you know, uh, queer and um, trans politics because that's something that wasn't as uh, explicitly in the media, et cetera, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I didn't know in the 60s, but 2000, 2010. So I'd love to hear what you're feeling or inspired by. Uh, well, I'm definitely um, moved and concerned about uh, pregnant inmates, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, prisons and jails are not meant for women. They're not built for women. They are... Mm -hmm. um, I, I read an article where um, there are more women in jails than almost men at this point, especially Black women. Black women don't typically go to prison. They let them stay in jail. So I am definitely against, you know, for-profit prisons. Um, I'm definitely an advocate for Black maternal uh, health care. Um, Black women die uh, more than any other woman when it comes to, you know, the maternity health crisis, that's a real issue. Why are black women dying, you know, trying to have children or a year after they give birth? You know, a lot of women just, a lot of black women are not making it in during their pregnancy. And it's um, because, you know, we're evaluated differently. You know, when we have postpartum depression, you know, our depression plays out differently. We don't, you know, we don't say that we're, we're sad or we're, you know, um, we're, we're upset, you know, you know, we say that, you know, we don't feel good or I'm not hungry or, you know, it just plays out differently and it's a culture difference. So those are the things that I'm personally um, concerned with and where my energy goes to, but I'm also, you know, concerned about um, my daughter's future, you know, um, I don't know what type of world is out there for her, you know, will she even have the opportunity to go to an actual preschool, you know, with this pandemic out now, um, the, with the upcoming election, you know, it's kind of like if Trump wins in office again, you know, we're all going to have put you know, essentially a target on our head because, you know, races will feel validated and <clears throat> they won't feel like they won't serve for any real consequences. If he does not win office, the same thing will happen. We will all have like a target on our head and, you know, sundown towns will like double. You know, my grandmother used to tell me about sundown towns, places you couldn't go if you were black after dark. So those are the things that I'm concerned about. Robin, I think we have a lot. That. Thank you for sharing that, Erica. I mean, those I think are such important um, concerns. One of the things that I have gathered from looking through the Robinson um, family archive, so lovingly preserved by Robin Robinson Kirkpatrick and family, um, and aided by there's so many people who have 
helped or sent acid-free paper and organized something in order to make sure that Pat's memory is just not in our head, but is something tangible, right? Because we can talk and talk about her, but you know, evidence to say, I knew her, I heard her say this, this is what I saw in her book, right? These are the things that, that we need to make a case for her. So um, one of the things that I've gathered is that Pat remained a very optimistic person. She was subscribing to and supporting radical periodicals and journals through the night, what can we call it, the nightmare of the Reagan years. <laughs> she continued to um, look internationally. And I believe that there were times where domestic politics might have felt you know, it's very challenging and she gained inspiration. I can see from her deep connection to what was happening, um, the revolutions that were happening, the fact that total change was still happening in parts of the world that she could point to and look at and become part of. She, I think her poetry and the fact that she read not just like hardcore political books, Marx, Mao, Lenin, although she did read those and those are hard reads. You know, it's not easy to read hundreds and hundreds and, you know, thousands of pages of political theory like that. And she she did that. But then she also read poetry. Um, she read um, novels and literature, Baldwin, Richard Wright, Alice Walker, um, Eduardo Galliano was somebody that she had um, in her in her library. So she brought a cultural element to it as well, right? She was open to revolution, meaning not just sort of hardcore change of politics, but also art and how you live your life and what you surround yourself with. And I know, I, I feel that there were times where she made her surroundings an oasis for her politics, right? There were times where she was out in the world and making political things happen there, but especially uh, maybe later in life when it good getting out there was meant something different. Also being around in the early days of the information superhighway, let's say, right? And then using email and things like that. I believe that she um, continued to draw such strength and inspiration from the art, the um, spiritual practices that she adopted, the poetry that she read, uh, the magazines that kept coming and that she kept giving away. She was not, she kept a lot of magazines, but she also helped people with subscriptions and she sent off magazines to other people who needed it. She was, she circulated things. She, she was a conduit. Yay, Robert. Um, I want to say something uh, because I don't see you physically, Erica, which means maybe your daughter is talking to you. Um, I wrote down a few things, but Jamie, if I need to listen to you first, I can wait. Yeah, no, you can go ahead. I just wanted to um, come in and say like, we're almost at seven o'clock and that we also have a lot of questions from the audience as well. And so to make sure that we get around to asking those questions, because I even got questions from like two days ago. So uh, <laughs> y'all were really excited <laughs> about honoring the life and legacy of Pat Robinson. And quickly, Lupe, to your question, I just want to go in when you were talking about queer and trans lives. Obviously, I didn't know Pat Robinson. I've just read her work from The Black Woman, edited by Tony K. Bambara. But I think she would be at the vanguard even today if she was alive about Black trans and queer lives matter because if she was advocating for and being an ally before it was before i guess um you know before the contemporary times i guess when it was in in media just imagine if she was alive today how she would embrace the movement and how she would be involved in the movement and how she would um, um speak up against the atrocities that are happening to our black trans sisters and siblings in not only in the US, but in the African diaspora. So I just feel that spirit and sense from her. So, but keep, but uh, if you would like okay. to- I'll Okay, quick, I'll, quickly, I'll quickly say that that's so beautiful because first of all, Pat got Jamie on the screen. Wow, Pat, you are powerful. <laughs> oh, Jamie. 
um, Erica and all the Ericas out there, because I don't know, uh, you know, child may be saying, I got to eat, I'm hungry, whatever. But first of all, bring your children to your political gatherings. Do not hang them at some other place and some place far from what you're doing. And have uh, Red Stockings and National Women's Liberation, they always have child care at every meeting. We will be past this, uh, I call it the depression pandemic, because the depression, uh, Pat would say, I think, is what capitalism does every seven to eight, ten years. It is an unplanned society for people. They don't give a damn about us. They don't want us to have sex freely and feel relaxed. They want us to be just working and get to the job and make these products, let us sell them, almost sell you, and then discard you like a, a piece of nothing. So bring your children, and then if you can, I would say that she would encourage the younger families, because your families now, I, I'm seeing so many people do more community family, you know, the uncles and the tios also being a part. I never saw, my father never pushed the baby carriage. Um, to look outside of capitalism as an alternative to the degradation of the human spirit and see what you believe in. I'm sure she would say something about Cuba and, um, and she did practice some of the Cuban spirituality um, practices. We can get into that later. I know somebody asked that in a question and we had that in the other time that we talked early this week, that the spirit can guide you as well as the conscious, disciplined theory and then practice with other people. So I hope that helps you a little bit, Erica, to know, of course, the sisters in the jails are, she wrote a beautiful piece. I just wrote it down so people could look it up later on um, pmrbio.wordpress.com. It's called The Historical Repression of Black Women's Sexuality. And she says, listen, we were, we're, we're still being used. Slavery is in effect in the jails. That's why they have those women in there, because they want to make sure that you are not able to ideologically clarify for your children what is the problem with, with capitalism. When you remove that parent who can be so uh, influential on making an opening for you to resist, you're going to have robots. You're going to have children who are robots. And I see that Donna Middleton is in here, so I just got to honor her. She's in that, um, I don't know, Robin, if you remember the title of it, but she's in here. She's in this uh, Words of Fire, Donna Middleton with Pat and some other people, uh, with a, a piece that they did. So I was going to say, Donna Middleton, if you want to write in the chat, how was it to have someone in your neighborhood who can talk and think and reflect you? Because that's another thing, Erica, that any young person's uh, inner self needs to be reflected. Even if you don't agree, I, I find it so helpful to at least reflect. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Robin does this with the students. Reflect where they're at and then draw them to a more... Uh, wide internationalist anti-imperialist stance, let's say. Yeah, there's some exciting stuff going on um, in the chat. To me, it reminds, well, there's a comment about Pat talk heard her views on sex. She wrote an essay, which I have excerpted on Pat Archives on Instagram. Um, and I excerpted it in the wake of all of the controversy over Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's um, song. And it talks about just sex and power and women and gender and, and all of that. And I feel like, you know, Pat, we can't underestimate the times that she lived through and influenced, right? So she's coming along at a time where ideals about sex, sexuality, whose orgasm ends the sexual encounter, who gets birth control and why and why not. I mean, these are the questions that brought Pat to Erica's attention. And these are the questions that were so um, common uh, at the time and were sites of struggle. And Pat reminds us that, yeah, Black women, Black people, all of the um, working class and poor people that pundits like to talk for and to glorify and to, you know, marginalize all at the same time that Pat 
walked alongside those folks and she, you know, did politics that way. Like that is what she did. And um, it's powerful because again, there's so many people who are deeply concerned and enmeshed in the fate of working people and people who are um, at the margins and marginalized today yet have never met a person like that or only have seen that person on the train or on the street or whatever, but Pat was there in your neighborhood. Um, so I think it was a very different kind of understanding of class. I think today we expect people of means to give money to the revolution or to open a business and go the black capitalism route. But she went the sort of, you know, co-conspirator route and uh, more people mm -hmm. need to know about that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. We have some questions and uh, we're gonna get into that. So can any, can you all see, this is Jamie, can you all see the questions? Um, if not, I can just read them because yeah. in the Q and A. Okay, so someone asked, Robin, could you speak about the process of researching and writing about Pat Robinson? Specifically, could you talk about using archives and about the form of biography for telling Black feminist revolutionary histories? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, I mean, I'm someone who understands that, you know, Black women's history is central. If we look at the video, we saw Pat answering questions at the kitchen table and the metaphorical and metaphysical kitchen table has been such a strategy space for uh, Black women as thinkers and as doers. And what I loved about finding Pat is that finding Pat was like finding myself. It was like finding a mirror. It was like finding more than her. That's the beautiful thing I think about Pat Archives is that, yes, it is the story of one woman's biography, but her story opens the door to, wow, if there was Pat Robinson, then there was Donna Middleton. If there was Pat Robinson, there was Matt Goulden. If there was Pat Robinson, they were, you know, fill in the blank. Um, it opens the door to kind of rethinking the great man top down view of history and politics um, that consistently leaves um, marginalized people um, in the margins. And Pat's archives is a gift because we have the evidence. I don't have to speculate or say, oh, she was doing this or she might've been influenced by that. Or, I mean, I will still have to do some of that because it's not an open book. Like it would have been great if I found that Pat Robinson had like started her own autobiography and you know, those papers were there. So it was her words, life in her own words, but she didn't do that, but, but she did leave behind a lot of stuff that's been so lovingly and carefully preserved, you know, by her daughter and others um, as a collective project of making sure she's not forgotten. I've gone to so many archives, institutional repositories, and you get there and you say, I'm here to work on fill in the blank black woman. Oh, their archives are off site because nobody looks for their stuff or, you know, we can't, we had just have this one letter, you know, or this one item. You know, there's thousands of items in Pat archives and it is, it challenges the ideal that scarcity is the predominant reality of contemporary women's archives. And it makes visible the way that people are archiving themselves. That it's not, you don't have to go to archive school. Um, this is also a lesson of Pat archives, save your stuff, people, make sure that, you know, your contributions to history are something that can be passed down to your family members and maybe eventually um, to a place where the public can gain access to it so that we don't have to say things like, well, was anybody protesting, you know, Donald Trump who was from the Bronx? You know, because we have old oh, reams and reams of paper and, and things like that. We don't have to say, oh, Black women, they didn't use Marx or Lenin. I mean, Pat used these theorists not as uh, intellectual gl glasses, that that's all she did was parrot back what Marx said or what Lenin said or what Mao said. She used her knowledge to really interrogate them, to read them. I mean, she's 
arguing with Du Bois in the margins of Black Reconstruction, right? She's in there with Cedric Robinson. She's in there with all of the big male thinkers that we know just like that. Um, but she is interrogating them and she's teaching other people how to interrogate them. So that I think has been the beauty um, of Pat Archives is just to have the evidence because um, we're not all going to live forever to be able to tell her tale orally, but we have the evidence that says this is who she was, this is what she meant in the world. And um, it's been a powerful thing to, to do it. That is why I call this project sort of the wildflower in my research life, because it is just, you know, uh, irrepressible, like Pat. <laughs> <laughs> That was great, Robin. Uh, I'm going to put in the chat again what Robin put, because I can see we need to keep going with this. And people, we may not be able to get to you every single answer, you know, save the chat and send it to you. So could you please email um, Pat? Is Could you say it for me, Robin? I, I got, oh, here's my glasses. You want to just say it, Robin, aloud? Yes, Pat is back, 232 at gmail.com. In addition to being a filmmaker, an activist, uh, you know, someone who is so interested in developing discourses and abilities to challenge racism and undo racism at all levels, um, Lupe is also an author. She's published a book called To Face It. And the character in that book, Pam, is inspired by Pat Robinson. So um, she's getting together an online book salon uh, on November 12th at 8 p.m. So to be part of that, email Pat is back 232 at gmail.com. Pat is back 232 at gmail.com. I'm going to put that in the chat right now. And you can also find out more information. I'll give you, I'll remind the public that that's happening um, on the Instagram site. Great. Oh, that's great. great. And also too- uh, and, and please donate to the archives and donate to Black Women's Group, uh, Black Women Radicals, because this is what Pat used to say, uh, you know, you're working so you can make a contribution because Black Women Radicals gave this, gave this to us. So I hope that we will do that. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you both. And I really want this question to be asked because they, um, Tamara Alcott wrote this two days ago <laughs> to me to make sure to ask about Pat. So I really want to do this. So um, she wrote, Pat said, that's a kind of spiritual power that there's no way you can defeat. Can you say more about what she meant by that? Uh, I'll start. Uh and Erica, I would love for you to jump in here too, uh, because just because people, I want to say this about uh, how capitalism affects us. You can't see Erica's face directly, so I don't want to put her out of mind, you know. Same with all those people who can't make it to get on these Zooms because they don't have a good website, I mean, web access, but they could be on the phone. So uh, when she says, you know, you can't defeat that, I'd like us to just, again, go inside and remember somebody birthed you and they went through pain, even if you have a terrible relationship with that person because capitalism dominated your mother, like it says in Lessons from the Damned, and made her into um, a weak pussy. And what I mean by that is somebody who became the ideology factory for the system and taught you to be dominated and shut up and I'm going to beat your ass or whatever it was or you should be quiet and good, or that's not workable, we're not gonna permit that. And just know that your spirit, even if you don't, because uh, I just wanna be full disclosure, me and Dr. Robin don't always agree on everything in the Pat Archives meetings, and neither does Robin uh, Robinson Kirkpatrick. The thing is that we can have our spirit connected to something that we believe in, and then act on it. Because I, I'll find it maybe while somebody else is saying something in lessons, what they talk about the bully, which we're dealing with a bully and a bully system that we, we have given. This is, I feel, Pat's message to me. She'd say to me, what's your part? Where are you allowing that system to be inside of you and believing that you don't have any power? Workers have the power. The women could reproduce or not. The women could reproduce or not. 
that's why that birth control at that time period, people, we used to have to get a lie going with the gynecologist say, I'm married in order to get a diaphragm. So that's what I think she means, uh, Tamara, that the spirit inside can connect with action because you have a belief that is deeply held in a loving, caring way. The Trumpites, the people who are in a system of capitalism who are just the, she calls them the uh, mercantile capitalists, you know, the ones who, the captains of industry, their soul is so empty, they don't have a spirit. She said the same thing about the uh, fighters uh, on the North American side against the Vietnamese people. Those people went underground in tunnels because their spiritual power was so clear and their dedication to their own lives and the ownership of their work as laborers called peasants in Vietnam was so deep that they defeated an army that had much bigger, you know, tools, but they went underground in tunnels. They had spiritual essence. They had connection with their inner self. Wow. I do have one more question. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> do you think Pat would prefer, or what do you think she would tackle first, patriarchy or capitalism? Because I feel like they go hand in hand. One, they prefer go together. Them? Hmm. I, I need a little help with the question. What do you think she will battle first, capitalism or patriarchy? Oh, devour first, you said? Battle. What would she put, what would she dismantle first if she could? I hope that I hope the panelists, Matt and the rest of y'all, I hope you're gonna put this in what you think is an answer, because that that's a precious question and I know we'll all have different views. I want to maybe read a quote from somebody that I found online talking about Pat. Um, I'll tell you their name in a second. I'll just have to scroll up for that. Um, but she's talking about the work that Pat did um, and the connection that she had with East Coast feminists and how Pat was central in kind of breaking down boundaries. Mm -hmm. So she says, through Pat, we began to anonymously share across ethnic and class differences, the letters and essays and poems that we were all writing to our fathers, brothers and husbands and sons as we struggled to understand how the patriarchy was coming down in our lives. One of the first things I read from um, Pat Robinson and the reason that drew me to her was her anti-Vietnam War activism. And I was struck that she, um, was part of this letter, which also some of the authors, co-authors of the letter are here with us um, in, the, in the chat, in the Zoom, where she talked about, uh, or where the authors talked about how the Vietnam War was a reflection of the types of power dynamics that they found in their lives as Black women in cities and poor Black mm. women. And that was the power of Pat was to take something that may seem far away. Like right now, all of the wars that the United States is a part of, all of the military bases, all of the deployments of troops, the general public in a sense that we're so focused on the things that are dominating our new cycle that those historic and longstanding um, realities of never ending war is not top of our agenda. And so to think about Pat having the vision in this collectively crafted letter to connect warfare in Southeast Asia to what was happening in South Central LA, what was happening in South Mississippi, right? So I feel like she was such a good uh, connection maker and I feel like she almost like she had like um, a decoder ring and she would decode the things that you may have thought, well, that's just patriarchy. You know, that's just this individual man or this individual person and me, that's our interpersonal problem. No, Pat would say, this is structural. This is bigger than your individual 
personal problems, she would let you know that it was bigger than that. So I think that she wouldn't even, I think that she would just be simultaneously dismantling things. And that's the interesting thing in talking about her, that I can say that she was anti-capitalist, she was an anti-imperialist, and she was, um, you know, fighting for uh, women, for uh, uh, LGBTQ um, plus community. And she did all of those things simultaneously. And when they were not popular, I mean, she was an advocate in the HIV AIDS, um, you know, movement. She highlighted men who were moving against sexism. So she's somebody, she shows up in all of these places and she reminds us that, hey, these movements were deeply connected. And when they thought they buried those movements, when they'll tell you the 60s were dead and seven, you know, those seeds were there and Pat was one of those seeds. I, I hope people heard, I, I wanna accent what you said, Robin, and I, I'll read first what Matt put in the chat, which is uh, Erica, patriarchy, um, racism, these issues come under imperialism and capitalism. In other words, they benefit uh, capitalism to have a patriarchal structure because if you can create divisions, you can steal the people's labor and make them think that they have a good little uh, life because they actually have a job. So what he says is capitalism is the overlying structure. Racism and patriarchy are the two main pillars that keep capitalism in place. In all my talks with Pat, personal and political, political and personal, it always came back to capitalism. And Yvonne says she often asks her clients to look wider, to not be narrow, wider, to not be narrow. And I want to read something from uh, Lessons and invite you to, uh, to know that it's so intertwined. That's what uh, Dr. Robin was really helping us to see. That was one of the major joys, I feel, of being around a path that when you can keep those connections going so you don't get stuck, oh, it's just this, or we gotta do this first, you keep it going on all fronts with the energy that you have, you go with what's most affecting you or what's most primary for you right now. And yet coalitions, she was constantly making us aware that, okay, I disagree with so-and-so on this topic, but the left gets so sidetracked in these different little silos and we don't keep the conversation going with, each other. Yes, please follow the uh, Instagram because then you'll get some of this info. So this is from um, Lupe Families to Face It, but I had to put this in about Pat. She's called Pam, and it says, to all of her colleagues, Pam shows her very radical aspects. She believes that relationships, even social relationships in this society are affected by racism and the economic system. Pam goes for the core of an issue and also connects. And I won't finish that sentence because that's the whole thing. Connect the patriarchy with capitalism and see how you can fight it whatever way you're, and, and surpass it whatever way you can do. And then the thing is how the family, so I think the family comes in as one of the biggest tools for where your false consciousness comes from because we are so tenderly cared for sometimes just by the fact that we get born, you know, even if your mom was on crack, you still got born, you know? And the thing is, she says, um, listen, people, don't cover up your convictions, don't change, and connect the nuclear family, which has been unable to make a living in this society, in this U.S. economic system, and expose that. So keep exposing, I would say, patriarchy and capitalism in answer to that particular question because that connects it. And then people who want to do patriarchy first, they're doing that. People who need to do capitalism first, they're more on the economic, let's say, but like Matt said, it's underpinned by racism, sexism, classism, ableism. All of that supports this horrific uh, economic structure that is, is actually defeating the planet from having her life. Oh, I didn't say the thing from lesson. Just one thing about lesson. She says all the young black and poor people, I say she says because she, I hope Maureen puts something in here. 
they would be in these rooms of her house and they would be writing their own little pieces for this book. And then she would say, okay, uh, here's what the Wall Street Journal says about it. Here's what, you know, Malcolm X said about it. And then people would make their own choices. So I turn that back to you too, Eric. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. But in this book that she helped to edit, the people say two important points. Fascists like Trump and reactionaries are unable to be deeply dialectical, meaning that it takes two, and analytical. They have no sense of historical forces constantly bringing unending change. They cannot see life as a process that can be understood by the oppressed. And they don't realize, because they have such a need to stay on top at any price, it absolutely blocks their ability to see, think, and act in a correct way. So you're asking how to act in a correct way. Keep thinking and keep seeing. Oh, gosh. I hope this is on. And then it says, we are young, black, and poor people who knew when we were small, many of the grown-ups around us were dangerous. They were against your sexuality, or they were against the fact that you sided with the underdog at school. And they said, no, you should be a wannabe. And then they say in the book, Working People's Book. We couldn't put it into words when we were little. We couldn't think Marxist, Leninist theory, but the historical changes in our world revolutionary era, which is right now too, in our own lives, Erica, finally showed us that we were the life of the future, the grown-ups feared and hated. They could not stand the reality of being displaced and the necessity of death any more than their masses can. That's why they can't be able to be reborn or changed. So in the coming historical periods, I'm adding the S, poor women, workers, peasants, the youth, third world people, and I'll add gender non-conforming people will have to take responsibility for going deeper into our experience and our need to subordinate ourselves. So that helps you to defeat capitalism and patriarchy because we need to subordinate ourselves. I know that sounds so horrific, but why haven't we all united to revolt? Because we're still afraid, but we can do it. Yes, I love that. Thank you, Lupe, so much. Um, and I know we're about to come to an end to the discussion on Pat Robinson, but I, before we close, I really want to thank Erica, I want to thank Lupe, and I want to thank Dr. Spencer for um, just- And Jamie. No, 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 you don't. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you so much. No, I'm just really grateful for this enlightening discussion on the life and legacy of Pat Robinson um, to the point where, I mean, I cannot wait till Dr. Spencer publishes the biography of her life. And also thank you for the film Lupe for um, offering a contextualization of her legacy. And for Erica for reaching out I wouldn't have known about Pat Robinson unless Erica reached out to me um, earlier during the uh, zenith of the, I think during the pandemic actually, um, about if I heard of Pat Robinson and I'm like, no, but then come to find out, I read about uh, her work in The Black Woman uh, by Tony K. Bambara. So if you see how her spirit is connecting us together um, in, in very unique ways. Um, so. I just want to uh, give uh, everyone a chance if they want to plug something before we close, um, feel free to plug any upcoming events or initiatives that you have before we, you know. I can't wait till Dr. Spencer finishes the book so we can have like a book party. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Dr. Yeah. Spencer, talk a little bit about the archives. Would you be yes. willing? I want to talk about the um, actual archives. So there's you know, so much discourse around the the archive, right? But the archives of Pat's five are actually physical, a physical space. There's a home where all of the stuff is, you know, of her life, her books, her papers, her tea sets, her, her china, her record albums, everything like that. And um, of course, it every home requires upkeep, requires, um, support to keep the lights on, to keep the temperature controlled so that we can have some um, way of beginning to inventory and sort through the material until they can get to their forever, um, their forever home. So 
the Pat Archives Committee, myself, Lupe family, and then Pat's daughter, Robin Robinson Patrick. We do fundraising over the course of the year to support that. So I did put the Cash App in the text in the chat box. I'll put it there again if anyone wants to donate um, to towards the upkeep of the physical archives. And I think that there is something about the Pat Archives, which is metaphysical as well. That's why I have the Instagram account because it also, um, it's a mirror really. It's a reminder. It's, it's saying that Pat was important, but then so are you, right? So I love, I look at her bookmarks, right? Her bookmarks that she lives in her book and what does that tell us about history? Or the things that she scribbled in the margins and what does that tell us about history? And what is lost when we sit around and say black women did not leave behind an intellectual legacy, they didn't write speeches, they didn't, you know, they didn't do all of the things that men had the access to because they were the ones oftentimes helping men to type things and to get their papers together while their legacy remained um, unborn. So here's Pat Archives, a place that is pouring out with information, not just about one life, but about the 20th century, about the Black Revolution, about the global freedom struggle, about class struggle in the United States, which so often goes hidden underneath um, the veneer. So it's important to um, actually support the, the space, the actual physical home where Pat Archives is, and also continue to raise her name, right? Because mm. people get excited about the the women that we've heard about, right? Um, and they deserve their shine as well. But imagine behind each name that we know of, behind Anza Davis might be hundreds of women who were radical, who were transformative, who were gender non-conforming, who were um, trying to uproot all of these means of oppression. And Anza Davis will tell you that herself, right? It's not about me. And so it's, it's about mm. Pat, but it's not about Pat. It's about the Black radical tradition. It's about preservation as well. It's my pleasure to be on the panel with people like Erica, who's a young woman who is taking her magazine and her journal um, and trying to get it into physical stores. I mean, imagine Pat had hundreds of journals and magazines and pamphlets at her disposal in her home from all around the world, from Peking Review to Monthly Review to Emerge Magazine to Jet to all, you know, she had them all. And so Erica- Remember Emerge Magazine? That. Pardon? I said, I used to, I mean, I was really, really young, but my, my grandmother used to read Emerge and I was yes, like- Emerge Magazine. We don't ask, yeah. what happened to these things? Yeah, that was put it in the chat. Erica, put your magazine in the chat. Erica, put your magazine in the chat, would you please? Yes, okay. I'll put it. I think I just had it there. Uh, but yeah, so important to support everyone from, you know, Erica, who is also a mother, who is also trying to create all of this knowledge and put it out there in a space that Black women have been marginalized from, to Jamie, who has built this incredible platform which she's, she's not using to promote herself, but sharing with any and everybody that can, you know, meets the vision of what Black Women Radicals is about and their inclusive and transformative vision to Lupe, an independent filmmaker, an archivist, um, a speaker, a healer. So it's really beautiful that we all um, come together. I'm so excited to see all of the people in the chat, right, who, can say I knew her or I'm here to learn more. So thank you so much. Jamie, Jamie, tell us about your feminist university. Because they heard about the book salon. The chat is saying they don't know how to get it. If anybody doesn't know something, put it in the chat. We'll send you the email right now in the chat. Yes. Jamie? So recently, um, and also I saved the chat, by the way. So yes. Um, it's really great to have. Yeah, but, but let them get it now. You don't have a lot of help to help you to send out all those emails. So I recently launched a school for Black feminist politics like about two weeks ago. Um, and basically, um, I invite Black feminist organizers, educators, teachers, and it does. And you don't have to have a PhD to 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 lead a teach in or be involved. One thing I'm really dedicated to is about community and being community centric and not always like institutionally academic adjacent. And so um, this teaching about Pat Robinson is part of the school um, and part of learning about like what Dr. Spencer was talking about, 
how there's so many um, uncovered um, histories and productions and leadership of black women and gender non-conforming non-binary people around the world. Um, and how can we uplift their stories or how can we look at black feminisms plural from different perspectives in black politics? How can we empower black feminisms and black politics? So oh, thank you, Dr. Spencer. Thank you just so much. And oh, somebody said that they uh, bought a sweatshirt and t-shirt. Oh, wow. Thank you. I thank bet you they're so under 50. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's what we need to learn from. We need to learn from your generation. If that's what's important, we got to do it in a, in a conscious way. Yes, we do. And I, I just want to say this has been um, generative. It feels like full circle almost like we were supposed to meet. And um, I really hope that each day and every day we continue to uplift the legacy of Pat Robinson, whether it's through reading about her and, and, and connecting with other black women, but also just remembering her and her work. Um, and, and Jenny, can I add something and remember all the molecules because that's why the title of the bigger video series is Pat, a revolutionary black molecule. Cause she says, and Blanca Vasquez suggested to me, that's the end of the video loop, but you got to put it in. I'm not important. I'm just one little small molecule, but combine that together with a whole bunch of molecules and you got a power that's out of sight. <laughs> what a way to end that. That is so true. We're all molecules, definitely. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Lupe. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. Thank, thank you. you so much um, for everyone who joined. And you can also find this video on our YouTube to revisit again and watch and, and learn more. So also someone said, thank you, Molecules. Thank you, Molecules. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. I love it. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll be inside. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>